today on the Nourishing You podcast. I think doing too much cardio and the dogma that we've heard for decades, uh, exercise more and eat less, um, stress and stress, and you already have hormones that are putting you in stress. So three strikes, you're out, ladies. So we really got to rethink that. And it's not your fault. So I want to say that to everybody, because in the media and everywhere else, you are you have been told that. So it's not your fault. And it's, it's not mentally going to shift the first time you hear it. Or just because you've heard it here, we may need to be your eighth time. That's about the average that you hear this, that it sinks in, or you read it somewhere so that you can start making the changes because it's like you go to your favorite restaurant and you know what you've ordered for years really isn't good for you and it doesn't even agree with you. But when you go to your favorite restaurant, the tendency is going to be to order that same thing again. What do you like? Tell me what you like. And there's value in that because it almost gives the brain like a vacation, right? Holistic health is completely underappreciated, but so critical. Eating whole foods and the key is just to find something that you really enjoy. Welcome to the NAMP Nourishing You podcast. I'm Kristen Burkett. And I'm Diana Wally. We're your hosts for NAMP's podcast dedicated to connecting holistic health enthusiasts with each other to share practical information from the holistic wellness space for enhanced vitality. Diana and I are master nutrition therapists, board certified in holistic nutrition with private practices and an online joint venture that supports clients and practitioners as they strive to reach their full potential. We're honored to be hosting this podcast for NAMP and connecting our listeners with the latest in holistic wellness. If you enjoyed today's show, help us out by commenting below, liking this video, and subscribing to the channel to help us spread the word. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Nourishing You podcast. We're thrilled to have Deborah Atkinson with us today to help us maximize our exercise efforts after 50, something I'm personally excited about. Functional health coach, hormone balancing fitness expert, and Flipping 50 founder, Deborah Atkinson, has helped over 250,000 women flip their second half with the vitality and energy they want. She's the best-selling author of three books. You still got it. You, you still got it, girl. The After 50 Fitness Formula for Women, Navigating Fitness After 50, Your GPS for Choosing Programs and Professionals You Can Trust, and Hot Not Bothered. Deborah hosts Flipping 50 TV and the Flipping 50 podcast. She's an, NA, she's an AARP top podcast for 50 plus. She's a frequent speaker and TEDx presenter of everything women in menopause learned about exercise may be a lie. She has 38 years full-time fitness experience, is an international fitness presenter for associations, including the International Council on Active Aging, IDEA and SCA, Athletic Business, and can fit pro. She's an American Council on Exercise subject matter expert and prior senior lecturer in kinesiology at Iowa State University. Deborah is also founder of flipping50.com, the creator of the Flipping 50 Fitness Specialist Program for Fitness Professionals. She's a frequent contributor to At Huff Post, ShareCare, and other featured outlets, outlets on the Education Advisory Board for medfit.org. Welcome, Deborah. We can't think of a more qualified expert to talk with on this subject than you. So thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you for having me. And you know what? Probably all that alphabet soup was, you did really well, by the way. <laughs> so for anybody listening, I think the easiest way to say it is, you know, when women in midlife find that what they used to do isn't working anymore, I fix that. Absolutely. Yeah. You do. Well said. Well, you know, we were talking before we started rolling that it's been so great to learn from you over the years. And we really appreciate your dedication to helping us all stay vibrant and age well. You know, we know that getting regular exercise, some type of resistance training, cardio, balance work is really critical for healthy aging. So we're really excited to pick your brain on this topic. As Kristen said, you're, you know, we can't imagine anybody better. But first, we'd love to get to know a little bit more about you. And so tell us your origin story and how Flippin' 50 came about. 
The dirt. You yeah, know, the, the dirt. dirt. Okay. The tea, spill the tea. <laughs> and we're just going to let everybody else listen. That's, That's not true. a problem. Okay. Well, I mean, the truth about flipping 50 getting started was um, it was accidental, uh, truly. So at 49, I quit my job. I quit safety and security of a regular paycheck and all of the I really had flexible hours. So I had freedom, which is one of my number one values, you know. Um, and I like hard work, which I don't think you're supposed to tell the universe that because then it will make it you'll have some more. But I stopped to help fitness professionals. So you mentioned three book titles. I have three more that are for fitness and health coaches on how to build their business. And we had created systems in the business that I was working at coaching for that I knew. I mean, we we were not Einsteining anything. We were in the middle of the Midwest and the hardest economy ever. This was before the pandemic. Um, and I knew if we could do it, so could other people. And part of always what I've wanted to do is up-level the fitness industry, up-level it for consumers so we have better choices. Otherwise, what we were finding is that, you know, I taught in kinesiology and I would find students who I'd mentored from their sophomore year through their junior and senior year and followed them in their internships would come back and they have quit because they found out they had to sell and they hated that. And we need to empower them in order to how to do that because we need to keep the good ones. Otherwise, they're being outmarketed. And whether you have negative feelings about marketing or not, you're going to get a voice. You're going to get the loudest voice. And we just have to make sure it's the best and highest quality voices that you're hearing. So it's part of what we're doing here. So um, I set out to do that. And then I very quickly within a few months realized I can't have quit training and quit being in that environment, start giving advice for something I am not making my living on. So I decided I've got to pick a niche and I've got to continue to do that so I can tell them, here's what I'm doing. Here's how this is working. And I chose Midlife Women because for 30 years, even as a, an undergraduate, I was what you'd call maybe an older soul, the youngest of four kids. But my mom, who was 40 when she had me, but that was before that was sexy. And right, that was, that was at a time when everybody looked at my 16-year-old sister and thought I was hers, right? And um, she remarried my dad, who was stepdad who was 10 years older. So imagine my parents played bridge with everybody's grandparents, my friend's grandparents. And I was around older people all of the time, older siblings, music and the culture. And so it was more like I grew up as a baby boomer than as a, you know, I'm a tail end. I call myself a barely boomer. And I was comfortable working with all of the alumni. They gave me the older people, the older adults in exercise clinics as a grad student or an undergrad and then a grad student. So I'd been doing research without knowing I was doing research for Flipping 50 for three decades. And I kept hearing, nobody gets us. Like I'm going to my doctor and they just say, well, you're in menopause now. So yeah, you're gaining weight. Like you should just deal with it because that's how it's going to be. And they weren't willing to settle, and, but nobody was giving them the answers so that they could do it better. So I picked them on purpose and knowing, um, not knowing what I didn't know. Because at 49, I was still coasting and cruising along just fine, thinking, this isn't going to happen to me. You know, I'm going to be fine. And, um, and I was, till I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so I got another lesson, you know, at about 56, I, and I got the empathy that I really needed. I thought I understood my, my audience before, but then I really got the schooling. And, you know, so every day it's still, I'm in the boat rowing with everybody else. There's, you don't get to be immune because you're an expert or you're a personal trainer or your group fitness. And sometimes I work with that market and they're among the worst. They have the biggest struggle because they love it a little bit too much and it's too much for now. But that's how Flipping 50 actually got started. And then I was trying to work with fitness professionals while Flipping 50 just took off. 
because nobody was doing it. Nobody was talking menopause fitness in 2013. And now there are a lot more and we're trying to train more and more flipping 50 menopause fitness specialists. So that's the story. Man, that's a fantastic story. <laughs> and it's like, like I'm sitting here with a kindred spirit, like <laughs> <laughs> I flipped 50 a while ago and yet yeah, took a while for it to set in. And then, oh yeah, it hits. And <laughs> even though you're in this field and you feel like you know all the things and you're doing yeah. all the things, there's still parts of it that just, that get you. And you've got, mm -hmm. you've got to keep working at it. You've got to keep learning and keep growing in it. So fabulous topic. Thank you for the work that you're doing because we definitely need it in this space. Um, so I want to get started. There's so much confusion on what's appropriate for exercise and for exercise mm -hmm. goals after 50. And, you know, I hear it all the time. Should I work out as hard? Can I work out harder? Should I change my goals? Um, how much should I work out? Mm -hmm. It's a long list. And I think there's, you know, we just, like you said, we don't have the direction um, in this age group. So mm -hmm. can you start out by sharing what you've learned over the years and seeing as the most common health and fitness goals for women over 50? Well, I think the top three goals, and I mentioned these and you still got it, girl, are in order. Uh, I want to lose weight because menopause has kind of slapped me in the face and, and punched me every other place. Mm -hmm. And nothing I do works anymore. If I had a dime for all the times I've heard that, right? Um, so that's number one. Number two is bone density. Because mm -hmm. either yeah, they've watched parents um, like me just recently watched my mom fall. And that was the beginning of the end. And I thought... Well, this is so surreal, right? I've been teaching this for 30 years, saying this is what can happen, and it's happening right now, right? But, you know, then it becomes, it's you. Like, okay, mm -hmm. that's my future or it's not. What am I going to do differently? And the third is those people who do want performance, you know, there's not necessarily something wrong, but they want performance either in golf, they want to play tennis better, they maybe it's pickleball now, or mm -hmm. um, they just want to function better and more comfortably. And, you know, I think that comes back to the goals. Like, um, so I want to that's stuck in my head, I want to eradicate that one. So should I change my goals? I think hell no. There we go. Good. Can Good. I say that on this show? Yes. Okay. You can now. <laughs> Good. Good. I know your dog's in the room. Just a couple of <laughs> So I'm curious about your thoughts on mistakes. So the biggest mistakes that women make over 50 with exercise. You know, there are a couple that I see with my personal training clients. So one is they think it's too late to get started. You know, oh, I won't see any benefits now that I'm over 50. Another, which really mm -hmm. vexes me, is focusing on cardio at the expense of resistance training. So mm -hmm. they don't understand the benefits of resistance, resistance training, or it's, oh, I don't want to get big muscles if they only knew how hard it was to, <laughs> for women to, you know, get, 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 get muscles. Um, so what do you see as the biggest exercise mistakes by women over 50? I think you kind of nailed them, seriously. So if I were going to recap what you just said, I think doing too much cardio and the dogma that we've heard for decades, uh, exercise more and eat less, um, stress and stress, and you already have hormones that are putting you in stress. So three strikes, you're out, ladies. So we really got to rethink that. And it's not your fault. So I want to say that to everybody, because in the media and everywhere else, you are you have been told that. So it's not your fault. And it's, it's not mentally going to shift the first time you hear it or just because you've heard it here. We may need to be your eighth time, that's about the average, that you hear this, that it sinks in, or you read it somewhere, so that you can start making the changes because it's like 
you go to your favorite restaurant and you know what you've ordered for years really isn't good for you and it doesn't even agree with you. But when you go to your favorite restaurant, the tendency is going to be to order that same thing again and just default to your habit of going for that run that isn't serving you well right now, even if you have every evidence it's not working. So it's, it's exercising more thinking that what you're doing now that isn't working, if you do it more frequently, you do it longer or you do it harder, it will miraculously begin to work. It doesn't work like that. You should be getting little clues when you're doing a little bit that it is working. You're feeling better, more energy, sleeping better, better libido, better appetite, no cravings. All those little signs should start when you're doing a little bit of the right thing, then you can try dialing that up, maybe extending your time, but don't try increasing frequency, duration, and intensity all at once. Because then what we don't know is what was it about that that didn't work. Yeah. So when we tend to push like that, what does that do for our results? How does it, how does it impact pushes them further away. Yeah. Because what we're doing is adding stress. So if we're eating too little, that's your body's under stress. I mean, it likes to eat, right? We like fuel for women, especially low energy availability is really a thing. And I'm going to kind of back off of that and leave that up to you, but it is a piece of the exercise and why the exercise you're doing may not be working. It may not be there's a problem with the exercise, but it may be a problem with what fuel are you putting in to give your body so the exercise can give you all the juicy benefits that you do want. So that's one issue. But low energy availability causes stress. Exercising is stress. And even if we say, well, I'm just going to go for a walk with say a little dog, right? Not even a big dog, but I'm going to go for a walk. That's more stress for your body than sitting on the couch. And so you're getting up in front of a, in a big audience to give a speech. All of us would expect to be a little bit nervous, but we give that speech and then it's over, stress gone. Mm -hmm. What happens with exercise now in midlife is we're exercising and causing stress on top of stressor, on top of stressor, because we're in this definitely sandwich generation, our young kids, you know, young adult kids maybe, but they don't stop calling, right? I mean, they they still want something. They still give you something to, to worry about or wonder about. Our aging parents on the other side or siblings, you know, are there. We're worried about them and we're caregivers and for our friends and, you know, friends in Florida right now. I mean, we're worried about them or family members. There are all kinds of things right now that are piling on us at midlife and our hormones too. So all of those stressors, if we get too much stress from the exercise, so this moment of that we're in in midlife is actually caused to say, wait a minute, the number one tenant of flipping 50, the very first one, it's like the 10 commandments, rule number one, restore before more. So if you're already tired, we need to take a good look at what you do do need to do, but more importantly, what don't you need to do? If life right now is causing the stress, it's the workout. What you really need to do is maybe yoga or go for a gentle walk at sunset when it's beautiful and relaxing. There's, you know, I feel like there's always this push, especially for women to do more. And we always mm -hmm. feel like obligated and weak if we're not able to do what we had planned to do. And mm -hmm. so I think we neglect listening to our own body to say, you know, mm -hmm. today that going to that workout or doing that workout is not going to be a good thing for me because mm -hmm. of X, Y, Z, or because of these stressors, we're so afraid to let go of what we had planned or what we had scheduled or how we think it's supposed to be and really listen to ourselves and listen to our body. And um, it, I've, I've had a major shakeup with that recently, personally with an injury and had to, <laughs> after trying so hard to just plow through it and it's going to be okay, recognizing, no, it's not. And if I don't listen to my body now, I am never going to be okay. I'm going to mm -hmm. put myself in a chronic position. So 
you know, I think you've really hit on something in terms of, you know, I don't know why after 50, it becomes more important. It's probably just as important before, but maybe the stressors are different and how they impact us after mm-hmm. 50 and that need to tune into ourselves. So I think you've really touched yeah. on That's a big common denominator among women in midlife. And honestly, I wish I could. I can't point to any research. So I'm a Mm -hmm. science girl, and I know somebody may be saying, well, show me where that is. But among medical exercise specialists like myself or personal trainers or physical therapists, when we get together and we're talking about our midlife clients, the common denominator is that injuries do occur more frequently. I know that it's tied to hormones and we know something called, there's a phenomena literally called exercise intolerance. And it's tied to a lack of estrogen, a lack of estrogen receptors. You know, mm-hmm. that may be a piece of the connection, but unfortunately, I mean, it is in the literature that this happens, that things like plantar fasciitis, elbow tendonitis, you know, all of the itises, which are chronic, they happened in midlife and yet they were coming on much earlier. It's cumulative effect. And it can be all of the stressors, the cortisol that's present now that you just hadn't filled that bucket. It hadn't spilled over until now. And now it is. And, um, probably very likely caused by hormones, but we don't know the exact phenomena, but it is common. So I think you do have to pay more attention. And, you know, we now to talk about exercise in cycles for women who are still having a regular cycle. Every week of exercise should not look exactly the same. There are weeks like when you're premenstrual right before that actually you should eat more and exercise less and tune into what many of us have fought forever, right? Said, oh no, I'm not going to, and I can't. And actually your body has actually got a higher metabolism at that point. It's a great time to go ahead and feed it a little bit more and to back off because you're more likely to be injured and dig yourself into an adrenal hole if you keep going. And I, I really just want to reiterate that restore before more mm. to all you ladies out there. That was a goose bumper. And <laughs> I, I've actually had to escort clients out of the gym that came to meet me. You know, I had a woman who got into a car accident, came to work out. I'm like, what are you doing? Felt one woman fell off her bike, you know, and then just women dealing with traumatic things in their life. And they come to the gym. Like, it's okay not to come. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's okay not to come. Yeah. You know, and I want to come back to what you said earlier, you know, about we seem to think, women seem to think they have to do more or should do more. And and I think the big awareness there, the big ahas, we tell ourselves that. I don't know that anybody else is telling us that as much as we're telling ourselves that. There is something, and and we also, we start these lists, you know, but about the time we get to the bottom, we add more to it. We never allow ourselves to get to the finish line. Yeah. Isn't that true? Mm-hmm. I do love lists, I confess. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so let's shift gears a little bit and let's assume that somebody's feeling great and and they've done they've restored themselves, they're ready for a little bit more. Yeah. So we know that fitness is not just about looking great. There's nothing wrong with aesthetic goals, but I feel like as as we get older, we should really be thinking more about the actual health benefits of exercise. So, you know, other than looking more toned, what are some of the most important reasons that we should be exercising? Um, you know, one thing that comes to mind is preventing falls, like mm-hmm. you mentioned with your mom. But but what are some other reasons that we should be exercising beyond just those aesthetic goals? Yeah, well, it's your longevity and your independence, number one. I think if you think about, you know, there was, if you're a caregiver right now, I think this really hits home. You know, you may be taking care of somebody and doing all of the daily necessities that they can no longer do for themselves. I don't know about you, but as much as I can keep somebody from having to wipe my backside, 
I'm going to do everything I can, right? I don't, I don't want that for my, I don't have daughters, number one, but I don't, I don't want that for someone. And, you know, at some point we're going to be in that position and I hope it's for the shortest part of my life ever. And, um, you know, carrying your own tray in the cafeteria, that's going to be sexy someday, right? Not having someone Overhead else. even. What about right. overhead? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Truth. But also, so bone density. So to avoid falls, but also to avoid the fractures if we do fall. And, you know, I want to want to say this, and I think everybody needs to hear this, that, you know, there are a lot of women who will be in their 50s or 60, closer to it, before they get their first uh, bone scan and really find out. And many women just are dev devastated or insulted almost that they have that diagnosis. And I think really the reality is most women over 40 have it. They just don't know it. And so I would say to those women who get a diagnosis, yes, take it seriously. I'm not saying that, but you have to remember how did you feel yesterday? I mean, the only thing that changed is your awareness that you have this. And hopefully it, instead of scaring you to doing less, it actually inspires you to make sure you're more consistent, to actually do everything you can. We used to think in 1995, I started lecturing on osteoporosis. I had to tell women what it was. We didn't even know. It wasn't the household word it is today. But we now know that you can improve your bone density after 50. I find that women who are on HRT, bioidentical HRT, um, actually have an easier job of doing it. But when we clean up their gut health, we have them doing the right strength training. I mean, I've had members through the pandemic doing it at home safely and increasing their bone density. So we know it can be done. We hear it every day. And um, so I don't want you to think it's over. We used to say, all you can do is put the brakes on the losses and not true anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brain health though is, on, is one more. So that's not too sexy. We don't talk about it, but I heard from the research and, and I can't say this for myself because apparently I'm too vain, right? But that brain health, Alzheimer's and dementia are really a number one fear for women. And exercise is a huge buffer for that. Can you expand on that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So strength training, both in cardio, but strength training, probably a little bit more so. And that spills over into um, cognitive processes. So problem solving solutions, but also decreasing the risk of anxiety and of depression. And like the statistics are about 51% is 61%. They don't quote me on that, but very close to women respectively struggling with depression and anxiety, especially after the age of 50. So, um, you know, exercise is a great boon for that. And it's not necessarily going to replace medication if you're already taking it, but it may reduce it. And exercise has no negative side effects while every medication we know does. Right. You know, I think it's such a big shift to make mentally you know, when we turn 50, it's always a big milestone, right? And mm. we'll have different emotions about that birthday, you know, positive or negative, whatever. But, you know, there's like this fight in terms of growing older and admitting that we're growing older. And so making that mind shift into what can I do now to really make this next half of my life as vital and maximized as I can and how do I need to be thinking about that differently than the first half of my life? And, you know, because the first half it's, it is more about you exercise for fun and have us, you know, mm -hmm. looking good. And can I wear the bikini and, you know, all those things. Right. Mm -hmm. But really we're, we need to shift into the mindset and it doesn't mean like we're giving in to getting old, but it's being real about aging and how to protect ourselves. Right. And right. being conscious and aware and um, you know, getting ahead of the curve on how do I protect my bones? How do I get to a point where when I am 20 years from now, this 50 mark, I'm not worried about osteoporosis and having and breaking a leg or, you know, whatever it might be. So it's just such a mental mind shift. 
And I guess I just want to encourage women out there to be open to that mind shift without feeling like you're giving into aging because it's not one in the same. It's more about accepting yourself for who you are, the season of life that you're in, embracing it and empowering yourself to make it the best that it can be. So I don't know, that just kind of hit me as you're talking about it because <laughs> you, you know, you're, you're sitting here talking about osteoporosis and brain health and all this and you all of a sudden you feel like you're in a much different decade than what you are because of what we're talking about. But really, if we don't want to be there, we have to start thinking about, about it now and taking responsibility for it now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Truth. Yeah. You know, and I think you said something like giving into aging and, you know, although I don't, I don't, uh, I don't advocate like anti-aging. I honestly think, well, let's lean into it. So, I mean, now we've got this wisdom we could never have lived our lives without had we not had that experience. So we've got a lot of on-the-job experience we could take forward. I think so many women will actually say that they're happier, you know, after 50 or after 60. And I think a part of that is we're just not afraid to admit we don't have all the answers anymore. It's okay to ask questions. Like I, I know I, for one was guilty of this, you know, often pretending I knew all the, all the answers and pretending, you know, to, mm -hmm, yeah, not having a clue. And I remember, you know, in my thirties, it was, well, I don't want to let anybody know. I don't know the answer to that. And now it's just like, no, if I don't know the answer, I'm just going to ask because how would I ever know all the answers to everything? Right. We weren't born with that. So I think leaning in to the aging and then just looking at what is my vision? What does 65 look like up here? What does 75 look like? What does 85 look like? And if you are not surrounded by examples that you want to aspire to, broaden your network. Oh, I love that. And find, um, find a mentor, find somebody to look up to. I have to tell you, ladies, there's a woman at the rec center in my town that came to work out with me. And I definitely consider her, her a mentor. She's lovely in her early eighties. And she kind of scared me that when she, when we first met, she hired me, she had heard about me from a friend hired me. And so I said, well, what would you like to work on, you know, today during our first meeting? And she said, I, I live in Colorado. So she's like, I am a skier and I want to ski really hard this winter. So I want you to work me out really hard. I was like, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> and she is <laughs> so strong, early eighties. I mean, she's, she's holding a dumbbell and squatting, you know, a heavy dumbbell. I mean, she is incredible. And I thought I want to be friends with you and I want to mm -hmm. be just like you when I mm -hmm. grow up. So just finding, you know, really healthy role models, I think can really help help us all. We all need people like that in our lives that are inspiring. That is so good. And I, I just got back from Colorado. So um, I think it's a Colorado is just a great environment. I mean, people go there to retire, to be more active, not to slow down. People are starting yeah. Ironman triathlons in their sixties. That's not necessarily a recommendation before, by the way, but um, <laughs> you know, starting things that they've never done that many other people in their 20s or 30s have never done. And that is who you want to surround yourself with. We have it fortunately at our fingertips yeah. right now. So look for, you know, this is my vision board. So I want to be, yeah, that's yeah. so cool. Yeah. So, um, you know, you talked about maybe starting an Ironman triathlon, you know, later on in life, might you might want to ease into that, or maybe that's not the best mm -hmm. idea. So kind of um, on that track, mm -hmm. you know, are there women that can over, -ex well, I know there are women that can over exercise, but the, to the women that do over exercise, um, you know, why would that be harmful? And maybe what, what, what does that look like, in your mm -hmm. opinion, if somebody's over exercising? Um, those women are saying, I can't lose weight. Those women are saying, I can't lose weight. I'm exhausted all the time. I'm doing the workouts, but then I'm on the couch till the next one. And then I do it again. That's what you're saying. You have no libido, right? So that's how we recognize that. And let's be clear. It's too much for you. 
your sweet spot for exercise right now with the hormone profile you have with the the other life stressors you have with the you know support system and the coping mechanisms that you have it's it's all different so we're three of us are here there are different levels of exercise that are okay for one of us that would be like poison for another one of us and and we will go through our own need to course correct so there are times when um Last week in Colorado, for instance. So as you might imagine, you know, the founder of Flipping 50 and a, of a stronger strength training program that's 12 weeks long that we launched several times a year, I'm an advocate for strength training, holding on to the lean muscle and boosting metabolism, getting bone density. I did no strength training last week. And what I found is, you know, I'm just a little more energetic this week in coming back to my weight training and feel like I actually needed that lift. There are periods of time when you're in it and you're disciplined, right? We lended to that earlier, that it's actually good for you to take cycles of breaks. And we're always going to be course correcting constantly on, oh, you know what? However I feel, whatever is going on right now, this is the data my body is giving me about the habits that I've got right now. So I need to change them. Mm-hmm. Tweak a little. Deborah, I am so glad you said that because I couldn't I couldn't believe all of the questions this summer from clients, um, you know, nutrition clients or, or personal training clients. I'm going on vacation and I'm so worried about not working out and mm-hmm. am I gonna lose muscle, lose strength? And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's about three weeks before we actually even lose muscle tissue. Mm-hmm. So it it takes a while. But to your point, you know, I would say, because this is true for me too, taking a a week or two off, maybe you'll feel better when you come back, maybe Mm -hmm. just breaking the routine a little bit or, or, um, rejuvenating, you know, as you said before. And I think people can take that into the holidays as we're approaching the holidays as well. And I preach consistency, consistency is king, but to take a little bit of time off, it's okay. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's, you know, it, 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 you could end up better on the other side just to rejuvenate yourself and, and get your energy back. Like you said. Yeah, totally, totally true. And, and it also takes very little to maintain, right? right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you can do a little body weight, something, you bring know, a band, right? you know, an exercise band or something. Yeah. Or just, you know, body weight squats. Yeah. And I'm not a, I, body weight is a challenge because I'm not, you know, doing pushing exercises and push ups, you know, closes you up. And if you don't do a corresponding pull, we're in trouble. And I don't know about you, but I still struggle 38 years in to do a pull up. It's yes. embarrassing. Yes, but- it's true. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. We we lose cardiovascular actually faster than we lose strength. We maintain the strength. We may lose some muscle mass, but the other thing that you may do is lose some stress because you're on vacation. And often for so many people, it doesn't matter if like under the hood you have this Ferrari, right? If you're I used to live in Colorado, drive home to Iowa. That's I-80 for any of you who've never been on it. But it doesn't matter if you're driving home in a Ferrari in summer when there's road construction, there's no shoulder and you're not passing. You have to slow down. If you have stress Mm -hmm. and cortisol, you will not lose weight simply because you're doing more exercise and eating less, which we know now, right? Those cause stress anyway, but you have to eliminate your stressors. And when you do that, then you can go fast. So sometimes vacation may be actually your ticket to, mm-hmm. wow, I I did this and gave you some freedom back that you didn't know you had. Like you can eat probably more than you thought and exercise a little bit less and get what you want. Yeah, that was a great analogy and a great message too. <laughs> <laughs> all of us to start thinking about. And it kind of brings me into, I know generally you have like this special sauce that you bring to the table um, in terms of recommendations and things that you give to women. Can Mm -hmm. you share some of your after 
after 50 fitness formula for it's a lot of, it's a lot of f's i know I, i'm sorry I, know. I love it i love it <laughs> yeah so i would right here i'll give it to you so it's really two two in most every day so two strength training sessions a week two high intensity interval training sessions a week and that's if you've restored before more. So you should already be feeling good before you begin those. And and it, we do that by making sure you've got highs and lows first. So setting a foundation of maybe it's walking for you or the equivalent of your walking. If you've got a an ankle, a knee, or a hip issue, maybe your walking is bicycling or rowing, something that doesn't uh, stress your joints. But you have that foundation and then you're doing strength training. That's your biggest priority next. And then HIT training, high intensity interval training. Let's clarify that. That's not just alternating jogging and walking. That is getting breathless, like hands on your knees, bend over. I have to take a break, breathless, a, a what we call a passive break. So you're not moving around like we in the 80s used to say, keep moving. We don't want the blood to pool, uh, right? So we actually do want you to just, the higher you work, the lower you're going to be in recovery. And that's the best benefit. It's like driving your car around town. You know, you soak up so much gas, you use it and you expend it. And that's how you actually want to treat your body during hit. You want to go fast, put the brakes on, go fast, put the brakes on. Cause that actually uses up a lot more energy than just kind of cruising along at steady state. There's still value in going for those lower walks, those lower intensity walks, but you don't have to do long hours of doing them. Just short ones still are very, very beneficial. So it's two strength, two high intensity interval training sessions, and then move more every day. Even if you have a sedentary job, you you need to break that up and try to get up out of your chair, stand at your desk, dance around, go to the women's restroom and dance in the stall if you have to, but whatever, try to move and don't have hours of sedentary time. That, especially for postmenopausal women, has been proven to be more associated with risk of obesity than exercise in a gym for 30 or 60 minutes. It's what are you doing with the other 23? That's great. So yeah. I'm curious because I know I've got, I talked with a lot, I talked with a lot of women that a lot of my clients are over 50 and I've got many that really haven't had a workout routine and I'm mm -hmm. trying to slowly ease them into something. I'm not a trainer, so I don't have all of the, mm -hmm. you know, the nitty gritty, but I'm trying to gear them to working with somebody that can help them. In terms of strength training, you know, I have a lot of women that say, well, I do walk every day, so I shouldn't have any issues with my bone density in my legs. Can you talk about strength training in a little bit more detail and like, <laughs> how, like how intense does it need to be? Like how much stress on the muscles do we need to have that just to give women an mm -hmm. idea of this is okay for you and this is necessary for you. We can't mm -hmm. simply do this and expect to get, do this for X and get this for Y. So can you just go a little bit deeper on that part? Yeah, great question. And I want to clarify something right now that what will work to benefit your muscle and help you gain strength and potentially a little bit of lean muscle mass. And I know if we say gain mass, everybody goes, nah, nah, nah. no, the psycho music comes on. You do want to gain lean muscle mass because if you gain lean muscle mass, you're boosting your metabolism. Ultimately, if you have body composition changes that need to happen, meaning fat loss, it will happen because you've gained the muscle mass. You will not get bulky. It's almost impossible. We never had those hormones. But if you're here, there's a chance if you're over 50, particularly, you recall when you lifted weights, you may have gained weight. But I want you to recall if that was a while ago, we were also eating high carbs. Mm -hmm. Hello, weight gain, right? So you were just a formula. And most of us learned when you first learned maybe high school or college to lift weights, the formula you were given was three sets of 10 repetitions. Anybody? That is our bulk building protocol. 
Do you want to go back and slap your high school PE teacher, right? And it's the best that they knew in the moment. So we now know so much more about, you know, higher repetitions, lower weight is another option, heavier weight and lower repetitions. So heavy that you may not be able to lift more than 10 or even eight or even six is ultimately okay for women who are here who are not high risk with osteoporosis and who've taken months to get there. So don't go in and start this today, okay? (laughs) However, I would have you look at your life and say, where might I already be doing this? Like pulling the 40-pound dog food bag out of the trunk. Mm -hmm. You're already lifting heavy in places in your life, so why wouldn't we prepare you for doing that, right? You're lifting that uh, wiggly grandchild you know, out of somewhere, right? And that's a 40 pounder too, right? And so you're not going to not do that. So I think you want to maybe just look at, you're not all that frail or vulnerable and you want to be able to do those things. So we should train for them because they're a part of our lives. But what works for gaining muscle and gaining strength won't be enough or adequate stress to continue to gain bone density. It takes heavier weight, more resistance in order to gain bone density. And that too has a progression. So I will tell you, if you were on the couch, not doing anything, if you get up and you start doing yoga, your weight bearing on your wrists and your shoulders and your, your hips, you're going to gain some bone density from yoga, but I'm a yoga instructor. I'm a Pilates instructor. I I don't discriminate, but you're going to hit a wall where after you've done yoga, you won't gain any more. You're just, there's your minimum threshold now has been elevated a little bit. If you're walking and you can walk a mile, two miles, three miles, more days a week will not increase your bone density. It's still only your body weight that you're using as the stressor so that you're hitting this minimal effective stress and then now you're not. So the only answer to that is gain weight, not recommended. All right. (laughs) Again. So now we've got to what's the next thing. So you could jog, you're going to get more impact. You could run, you could jump, you're going to get more impact But that's the difference between weight bearing and weight training. So we actually want both because you can walk every day of the week. And that that is helpful, right, in maintaining, but it's not going to gain you more. Strength training, we only can do two and or three times a week. And a lot of the studies for bone density are using three times a week. But as a woman who works with women only and exclusively now in menopause, what we know from research is there's no benefit between two or three times a week. There's no increased benefit. So Mm -hmm. with all of the women coming into menopause, often already exhausted and fatigued, we have to kind of balance what's good for bones and what's good for adrenal fatigue. We have to, we have to keep her exercising to get the bone density benefits. And we impose adrenal fatigue. We're going to need a vacation. And so we don't want that period of bed rest. And we don't want somebody to strength train and then go lay on the couch because she's tired because that all day is harmful to the bone. So um, we need to keep in, in fact, all of those factors. So the two time a week I choose on purpose. So it gives adequate recovery for muscle. It still gives minimum effective stress for the bone, but it allows for energy and vitality. We have to remember the exercise is supposed to give us back our lives, not take it, not take the energy that we can use doing things we love with people we love. And I'm assuming you're, you're saying to take at least a couple of days in between those two days a week. These are not back to back days that we're Great. Yeah. Great clarification. I prefer 72 hours, especially if you're going to just exercise twice a week, not back to back, but not even, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday was so ingrained in us, right? From, you know, we grew up in Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. But that was the fitness center schedule. That was not yours. What was ideal for you? We just fit somebody else's. And now we need to demand, 
you know what? That schedule's not working for me. I really need Monday and Thursday. So that 72 hours kind of positions your dose of exercise, if you will, kind of in a more rounded way. So you got to hit, you got to hit. There's not a lot more time between one or the other. Yes. I always tell people that they should feel better after Mm -hmm. they leave the gym. Mm -hmm. You should feel better than when you went. Yeah. Within two hours, you should be bounced back feeling good. Yeah. Awesome. So I know you're so great at like, I know we kind of poo-pooed the list earlier, but you have like these different things. Like you've got your secret sauce that's got your formula. And then you also have 10 tenets that I'm, Mm -hmm. I know I've seen in the past of flipping 50. Can you share a few of those with us? I don't want to give everything away, but we'd love to hear (laughs) with you. Yeah, absolutely. So number one, of course, was restore before more. And that is first because, you know, those of you who are are trying to exercise and you're already exhausted, you can't get fit digging yourself into a hole. Not going to work, right? So the basement before the penthouse. Um, Number two is intense early and light late. So while what kind of exercise you do matters when you do that kind of exercise also matters. So a lot like foods we've learned, but intense, early, light, late, the alliteration helps you remember it. So among intense exercise, uh, definitely high intensity interval training where you're, you're going to breathless and recovering, going to breathless because it adds a little more, more stress. The way we balance that stress, by the way, is those sessions are very short, 15, 20 minutes, Total, total, warm up and cool down included. So at most about 30 minutes. So I give people a bank of, you've got 45 minutes to spend and you don't have to spend it. You can leave some in the bank, but that's per week. So that's like three 15 minute sessions. It's two 20 minute sessions. When you start, we, again, we progress. We start with 10 minutes once. How did we feel? So Intense, early, light, late, you could get away with strength training later in the day if you absolutely had to. So I know somebody's here and they start early, they commute, and it gets to be tough. So you can probably get away with that because it doesn't rev you up quite as much. But I would forfeit or rethink potentially your boot camp attendance at 5.30 p.m. Yeah. And I I think don't look at it as that's the only time I can do that. And that's my calorie burning. You may actually find you reach fitness better, faster by not doing it than by doing it. Next is, uh, boy, there's a lot I could go to, but GoPro is another one. So kind of getting into the uh, nutrition side of things. So we've got to have protein, which is the building block of the muscle, and it has to be high quality protein. And when I talk protein or start that, it, everybody gets a little bit nervous and, and women just get a little riled up and their husbands say, oh, you don't need that much protein. <laughs> and the truth is, you know, we know so much more about longevity and aging, avoiding frailty and sarcopenia, which Today is not quite a household word, but in 10 years, it's going to be a household word just like osteoporosis is because more baby baby boomers are experiencing it and we are going to be 10 years post-pandemic. And what do we have in a pandemic? A global dumbbell shortage when everybody was at home. So women not lifting weights because they didn't have access to the gym, we may see problems if we don't start mitigating that right now. So there's three. How's that? <laughs> well, and I like that you, you brought up the protein one because it seems like almost every episode that we talk to a, um, a, an expert or a guest in a different area, the subject keeps coming up about protein. And mm-hmm. um, we, you're right. I don't know why women get nervous about protein and yeah. afraid of protein, but um uh, you're right. It's a building block for our muscles and we don't have muscles. We can't can keep our bone density and, you know, it all works together and it's needed for so many other functions in the body. But anyway, so I'm glad that you brought that up because it just kind of reiterates something that we keep hammering on yeah. <laughs> from the side. So I love that. And I, one thing I love about your approach, so many things, but is that you take away a lot of the barriers 
um, that, that would, that prevent people from starting an exercise routine. And I think a lot of that is around, I don't have enough time. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're saying, yes, you do. It doesn't need to take that much time. I don't know what to do. You have programs. It's really removing those barriers and making it easy. Mm -hmm. So true. And, you know, I think that too comes back to surround yourself with an environment of people doing it. Cause often in your immediate environment, you know, I'm an Iowa girl, you know, in the Midwest, if you look around, if you were fit or trying to be regularly fit, I mean, you were swimming upstream. You're all by yourself (laughs) and resistance in here comes ample, you know, enough that we don't need more external resistance. So you got to surround yourself with a community of people who's doing what you are doing or what you want to be doing. Well, I hope that, you know, part of what this conversation triggers is for the fitness professionals out there to become more aware of this niche and this need for, Mm -hmm. you know, in our area, I guess, you know, we've talked about this in Colorado, everybody's extreme in terms of exercise, right? So (laughs) trying to find a place that you can go where they understand the needs and you're still getting the results is really hard to come by because everybody wants to fit you into the mold of the 20 year old workout that, you know, is so super intense and it's, it's not geared toward, you know, what we need for proper bone density and those kinds of things. So, um, you know, I hope it'll spur some people to get, you know, maybe into your programs that train professionals in this niche to, you know, I'd love to see someplace open around me where, cause I like the social part of going to yeah. work out with people. a lot of people too. I, I can do it in my basement, but I like being around people. Mm-hmm. But I'd love to be around more like-minded women that, you know, we all have this same goal. And it's really hard to find that kind of a spot. Mm-hmm. Truth. Yeah. I think being in parallel play, there's a lot to be said for that, right? I mean, just you're going to a place where this is the only thing people are doing. You cannot see the laundry and the, yeah. the doorbell doesn't ring. The Amazon guy's not here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, and being with with your people, you know, I was trail running over the weekend and I passed this um, gentleman. He was, I'm guessing, in his early 20s. And he I, I'm guessing he he looked at me and said, oh, I see this 50 plus woman coming up the trail. So he said, what are you what are you training for? Kind of like, what are you doing? And I said, I'm training for life. And Good like, answer. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, OK. My, yeah. my answer, too. Yeah. Like, yeah. Just, um, yes. Okay. So here is the million dollar question. So you're the expert. Tell Mm -hmm. us about your fitness routine. What does that look like right now? Mm. Really? I walk the talk. I promise you. Um, So twice weekly strength training to muscular fatigue sometimes. So outside of last week, right? When I was in Colorado, I did all my climbing and resistance training on hikes that I you know, was starved to do. So I did all my favorite hikes. So there was plenty of work going on, but, you know, I didn't want to waste my time in a gym, potentially getting, you know, sore or tired and not being able to do that. So it was like, this is the reason I lift so I can do this when I want to. Um, But twice weekly strength training to muscle fatigue, sometimes that has to be 10 minutes just as a consistency. You mentioned earlier how very important that is. And and a consistent message up here, I am somebody who regularly strength trains. That's the other important piece of that. Um, And twice weekly uh, hit. Actually, I did it this morning. Slightly different way than I normally do, but, you know, about two minutes, a little less than two minutes of really burst training to all out. And then in between, I cleaned up my backyard and hauled some big pieces to the dumpster. And then I was recovered and went back and did it again. But I was 15 minutes and that was too. So it just was like really short and really done. But it is when I have to do that, I'm saving myself uh, from myself, right? Because I'm an endurance girl. I would rather go for an hour run or go work out for an hour because I do like it. It's head clearing for me, but my body I'm finding adapts to something else just better right now. And so it's like, you know, I'm grateful for those times when I'm busy or on a time schedule. And then I do a lot of hiking. 
So I love to be outside and if I'm not getting there. So when it's been triple digits here, here's how I cope because that's not always possible. In some some places it's 20 below, right? Um, but I'll go to the pool. So it's the only time I could be outside here, you know, is being wet. So I'll go to the pool and swim mat laps more in the summertime instead. Or for those of you who are indoors, when I was in Iowa, it was swimming, you know, in a pool indoors instead. But uh, activity every day. Yeah. And I just real quick want to go back to something that you said, because this is yeah. something that I... Um, I really try to emphasize with my clients. You yeah. said you'll lift weights for 10 minutes. So some I days. will get all some days. I will get all the time from people. 10 minutes. What what good is that going to do? Do mm. you know how much you can get done in 10 minutes if mm. you're getting after it? Mm -hmm. Squats and push-ups and you know whatever that might look like. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes will break out my workout so I also have the ability to work out at home just some dumbbells and things. Mm -hmm. And if I don't have a 30 minute my workout takes about 30 35 minutes. If I don't have that time block, I'll do 10 and then 10 and then 10. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, you, you can, you can get a ton done in 10 minutes. You can break up your workout. So don't let that be a barrier to you. So I love, you know, you're the expert and you're saying, yeah, sometimes 10 minutes is, is what I got, but that makes a huge difference. It's better than sitting on the couch for 10 minutes. Right. So let's um, do this real quickly. And then I do have to jump off. I know. I know. <laughs> okay. So in using that 10 minutes really wisely, you don't do like eight or 10 exercises. You choose three mm -hmm. core muscle groups, your major muscle groups. If you want to have an impact on bone density, you want to have an impact on your metabolism and you do three cycles of those. So I'm going to do chest and back and legs chest and back and legs. So a squat, a chest press and a bent over row, for instance, three times each. And you have a little transition time and that's your 10 minutes. You're done. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So and thanks for that extra time. We're sorry. You're welcome. You we just, I feel like we could go on all day. I know. <laughs> but cannot thank you enough for your expertise. This has been wonderful. Absolutely. Great wonderful. to talk to both of you. Yeah. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. Yeah. Well, and thanks, Deborah. And thanks, everyone, for listening and tuning in. And we can't wait to see you next time. Take care. If you'd like to access other episodes or subscribe so you don't miss a beat, you can find us at nanp.org forward slash NANP dash podcast. Membership in the NANP provides you with a competitive advantage. Whether you're a current practitioner or a student, we want you to become an active, informed leader of the holistic nutrition community and join today at NANP.org. NAMP is very proud to provide the highest level of professional recognition and validation in the holistic nutrition industry through the board certification and holistic nutrition credential. To earn this valuable designation, candidates must demonstrate an exceptional level of knowledge and understanding of holistic nutrition by passing a board exam and documenting client contact hours. Are you ready to boost your credibility with board certification? Visit NAMP.org today to apply. Keep in mind that the information on the NANP podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical or legal advice. The NANP is not liable or responsible for any harm, damage, or illness arising from the use of the information contained herein. By listening to the information on this podcast, you agree to defend, indemnify, and hold harmless the NANP and all agents. Copyright NANP, all rights reserved.